Good morning, Acts 433 and online friends who are joining us. We are in a brand new series. Anyone guess what the series is? The God Is series, right? Today we're going to be touching on the self-sufficiency of God. And because this is such a huge topic, we're going to jump right in in John's Gospel, the fifth chapter. We're going to be looking at verses 24 through 30. Uh, And I'm going to start off with verse 24 right now. It says, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Will not be judged, but uh, has crossed over from death to life. Has crossed over. It's already happened. You see, in Adam, we lived on death row. We were born into a dying race. But whoever believes in Jesus has already crossed over from death row to new life in him. Now, if I was debating an atheist right now, if I had one in in the room who could comment back to me, the argument might be from the atheist point of view, uh, so do you think you're not going to (laughs) die? Do you also believe that the earth is flat, and do you believe that man has never been on the moon as well? Of course, uh, I believe that I'm going to die at some point. It's going to happen. But the scripture is very clear here. It says, but has crossed over from death to life, Yet yet we still die. So since Jesus doesn't lie, how do we reconcile his words here? Well, there are a few different uh, opinions here, uh, but uh, I'm going to share some that I don't actually agree with, and then we'll get to what I believe is really going on. So some people have explained, some theologians over the year have actually explained that your spirit is saved, yet your body is not yet saved. But I don't believe in partial salvations. I'm not a believer in that camp. Uh, Because it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Um, that we were made into a new person and the old has gone. The gift of salvation has already come. Salvation doesn't come to us on the installation plan. It's not three easy payments in 1995 and then you'll, you'll get your full salvation. It's not a partial plan. Whatever salvation is, however you define that, and we could get into that in the Greek and what that means, but Paul says this, he says, it the new has come. Salvation has arrived, and it's available in Jesus Christ. Uh, So either you're saved, or you need to be saved. You're either in the kingdom, or you're out of the kingdom. You're either one with the Lord, or you're separated from Him. There's no gray area here. It's either in Christ, or not in Christ, uh, which is great news, because it has nothing to do with your performance uh, record. It's not about our works, it's about His grace, and it's Uh, through his grace and our faith, that we're saved. So one camp says it's a partial thing going on. Your body hasn't been saved, only your spirit. I don't believe that. Uh, Another camp would say uh, we die out of ignorance. I don't believe this either. That Christians are supposed to be immortal right now. Um, And uh, they just say that uh, Christians aren't ever supposed to die. Well, if that was true, where's Peter today? Where's Paul Why did they die? That same camp that believes that will say, well, they were martyred. That's a special thing. I'd say, well, what about John? He was never martyred, uh, yet he died. So I don't think that that argument holds any water as well. It's not based out of ignorance that if we only knew that we were never supposed to die, that we wouldn't die. No, our bodies will die, and the Scripture talks about that. So if salvation doesn't come on installation plans, if salvation uh, is something that we've already received, every spiritual blessing in Christ, Ephesians 1.3, then why do we still die? Tune in next Sunday to find out. (laughs) No, I'm kidding. We've got plenty of time. So I'm going to actually share with you. We don't have to wait. Uh, Think about what happened to you when you were born again. You repented, you believed the good news with help from the Holy Spirit. This is all of our believers' stories. As you came to see Jesus for who he really is, and you changed your unbelieving mind. That's what repentance is. 
to change our unbelieving mind. Uh, one moment we were in the dark, the next moment we were brought into his glorious light. That is what happened to us. Uh, we used to be alienated, alienated from the source of life, but next our spirit has been fused with his. It's a radical change. And Jesus said, you've crossed over. You were dead, but now you have new life. You're a new person. So I was looking at it this way. If you've got your sermon notes, you can see this. Um, the word crossed over actually happened in the Old Testament. We actually see that Israelites had a crossing over that happened uh, in their world. And what happened is the Israelites crossed over the River Jordan and entered into the Promised Land. And something beautiful about this picture is the very first place that their feet touched, the very first place after they had their crossover, is this place called Gilgal. And Gilgal in the Hebrew means a rolling away of your shame. So we can see in Christ, as we crossed over from death row into life, we found that we also reached the place of Gilgal, where our shame and our guilt and our sin has been removed forever in Jesus' beautiful name. And you became a brand new you. So that's what happened. But your body didn't change. So here's the point. The point of all of this is you, and I know this is so hard for us to grasp, you are not your body. And the best way that I can illustrate this is, do we have anyone in the room who likes to do camping? And I know the answer to that is amen and amen, and so let it be, Pastor. <laughs> Let's have this rain clear up so we can go camping. Um, if you've ever been camping, you'll know that there is a big difference between a tent and your residence where you receive your ba your bills in the mail and your your all your good stuff that you get to take care of there's a big difference between a tent and a home a permanent home unless you're that one weird guy in dual survival then i think the lines get a little blurred i think he kind of lives in a tent um, your home is your permanent dwelling place your physical body on this earth is like a tent. It's the best way to describe it. It's temporary, and it's useful because you're on this camping out. It's called life here on earth. It's not forever. We're not always going to be in this tent. Um, it's not permanent. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul's very clear. He says, a trumpet's going to sound. The dead are going to be raised to imperishability, and they will be changed. For the perishable, the tent, our, our bodies, our earthly bodies, must be clothed with imperishability and the mortal with immortality. So we, we're going to have everything changed. Um, but thanks to Adam, here's the next thing I wanted to point out, is thanks to Adam and his regrettable choice, nearly everything in this world, that we see, and we're really going to get into this next week, um, about God being just. Uh, I'm not going to go too deep into it, but uh, we're living on this earth right now, and everything around us is still operating under the law of sin and death. We feel the effects of living in a fallen world. Um, this includes our body. So, like, if I volunteered at a school... And, and did some, and that would be fantastic. But let's say, like, I touched every doorknob, and then I, like, gave everyone a high five and a handshake. And then I'm like, it's time to eat lunch. And I'm like, I don't need to wash my hands. There's a high probability, like, when I wake up the next morning, my nose may be running, and I might have a fever or whatever. Because there's germs. Because we live in this fallen world, and our bodies can get sick. Our bodies can get ill. Um, we can feel the effects of what has happened as sin entered the world and death with it and sickness and disease and all that stuff. So it includes our body. We feel the effects, our body, and I don't think anyone would argue that. I don't think anyone would say, hey, I've never, 
ever been sore? Well, I've got some wood that I need splitting. If anyone wants to tell me that they've never experienced soreness, come and help and wake up the next morning and tell me that you, your body has never felt the effects. But it doesn't include you. That's the point. It doesn't include you. Because we're not under the law anymore. Christ fulfilled the law on our behalf. We live under this new covenant of his grace, which means healing is available to us, which means uh, deliverance, salvation, in all these forms. And like I said earlier, it's not an installation plan. It's not that God is only is holding back some things. Uh, but even if you receive healing in your body, what is that? When you look at all of eternity, I say, thank you, God, for my healing. Praise you for what you have made available to me in Jesus' name. But that's just a repair job on a tent, right? That's a patch-up job. Even if I no longer have a, a bum knee or a sore back or whatever, just wait a little bit. I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but like we still feel the effects. We're still going to, our bodies get old and we, we feel it. So it goes back to um, the fact that... Uh, Sin entered the world. But our citizenship is in heaven. That's the good news. We're awaiting Jesus' return, who by power, uh, through him, everything is under his control, will transform, in Philippians 3, he says, he will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. Praise God. What a good word. And that word lowly, I love it. It couldn't get any more clear in the Greek. It means depressing, humiliating. It's like when you take your shirt off and you're ready to go in the pool and you haven't worked out for a long time. You go, oh, this is just depressing. I shouldn't have eaten those potato chips. Come on. Or I don't look like I did when I was 18. Um, it, it happens to all of us. And that's what Paul says. He goes, your body is humiliating and depressing. It's feeling the effects of sin. Uh, but the great news is, He's going to transform our body to these glorious new bodies when we are in heaven. So that is, that is a good word for everyone, for those who are in Christ. And so really what death is, and this is what we look at by faith, this is the difference at a funeral for a believer, is death is a changing room. We're no longer bound by this body anymore, but the one that we love who has faith in Christ has this glorious new body that they have entered, that they have, and they're in heaven with our Savior for all eternity. There's no more repair jobs needed on their tent. So um, Jesus is making everything new. We can look forward to a new heaven uh, and new earth, 2 Peter 3, 13, and a new body. But you know what happens in when we go back to our text in John 5, 24, an insecure person will read the text backwards, and it's not intended to be read that way. They'll read it as, if I falter, if I mess up, if I make a mistake, then I might cross from life back to my old state of death. But Jesus said, no such thing. It's a one-way trip. There is no return back to the way you came. You're new. You're a new creation, creation in Christ. It's like the butterfly doesn't go, oh, I'm not doing well flying. I might wake up as a caterpillar again. Where's the cocoon? I'm going to reverse this. We're not alive one day, dead the next, then alive again. Um, and so now that we get the point of what he's saying, let's, let's move on to the next point in verse 25. He says, very, very truly, I... Um, I tell you that a time is coming and now has come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. When I read this the first time, a uh, long, long time ago, uh, I used to think of this as being the, that the dead who are being spoken of were just believers, but that's not the case at all. It's not just referring to believers here. Because when you bring in, when you read ahead to verses 28 and 29, uh, and then you come back to verse 25, the picture changes completely. Uh, he says, do not marvel at this, for an hour has come when all who are in tombs, all, will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So, the point here 
is that Jesus raises all the dead. That's what he's saying. So let that sink in for a moment. He's going to raise Julius Caesar. He's going to raise Judas Iscariot. He's going to raise Isaiah the prophet. He's going to raise Adolf Hitler and Marilyn Monroe and Kurt Cobain and Princess Diana and Mother Teresa and Muhammad Ali. And everybody is going to be raised. And that's remarkable. And Michael Jackson, too. Everybody. And they will all stand before him. We will stand before him, too. And what Jesus is doing here in his earthly ministry is revealing what it will be like in the kingdom. You see, he would um, cast out demons uh, from people that were demon-possessed because there will be no demons in the age to come. He healed sick people on earth because there is no sickness in heaven. He raised three people from the dead because death has lost its victory, death has lost its sting, and there will be no more death in the age to come. And he's revealing exactly what the kingdom is going to be like. You see, Martha didn't quite understand. And in this text, it's, it's very clear. Jesus says about her brother Lazarus, who she dearly loved, he said, your brother will rise again. And she says, I know, Lord, I've got faith. He's going to rise again when the trumpet sounds, when you come again and you call us out. But he says, no, no, Martha. That's true, but that's not, that's not what I'm talking about here. Um, he's saying, you don't understand. The hour is coming, and it's now here because I am the resurrection. I am the life. And by my very, very words that I speak, He'll live again. I can call him out right now. And that's exactly what he did. And so the hour is here because the mighty voice is here. And you and I, we will raise from the grave just as surely as Lazarus did. Because Jesus was revealing more of his glory. The glory of his sovereign voice over death. So here's the part, because I haven't even touched on the God is self-sufficient part, right? You're wondering. This is the next verse. For as a father has life in himself, verse 26, so he has granted the son also to have life in himself. What you might not have picked up is that word there, life, is this word zoe in the Greek. And zoe is this deep uh, meaning word that talks about this absolute fullness of life. That's what the Father has. That's what Jesus has. It means that God has no needs ever. He's complete and he's sufficient in himself. And that's a good word because I think a lot of times we try to make ourselves as the center of the universe and we think, I, God's called me to this noble task and if I don't do it, then how in the world will it ever get accomplished and get done? And, you know, a lot of humility comes out of the fact that God has no needs. It's amazing that he includes us in this glorious mission, but his words and his plans will never fail. Uh, they will be accomplished, uh, and we get to be a part of it for his glory and for our good. And so um, there's just so much wrapped in, into this. When we think of Jesus raising the dead by his very voice, by his words. John wants us to realize that Jesus has absolute fullness of life. Um, he doesn't channel life. It's not a moment where Jesus is walking through and, you know, maybe if he doesn't do something here or there, he won't have the ability to raise Lazarus. No, he's not channeling life. He is life. John wants to be very clear about that. So it's not like a we're holding our breath. Is Lazarus going to come out of the tomb? Of course he is, because of who Christ is and the fact that he has absolute fullness of life, just like our Father. So as humans, one of the things that we all have in common, doesn't matter what our background is, it doesn't matter what country we live in, we all have incredible needs. We can say amen to that. Incredible needs. 
And if you leave those needs unfulfilled, they result in death. Like if I don't eat for a long time, I'm going to die. You know, like if I don't get sleep, I'll lose my mind and drive into a tree. You know, I mean, like there's needs that we have. God, however, has never once been in need of anything. As Tim Temple writes, he says, God is perfectly complete with his own being. Scott Swain writes that the self-sufficiency of God, this is, what, this is what it means for us. He possesses infinite riches of being, of wisdom, of goodness, of power, of all this great stuff in and of himself. Because God is self-sufficient, we can go to him to satisfy all of our needs. And I, I want to be clear, because needs and wants are completely different things. And a lot of times we might pray and have some wants, and uh, when we understand that God wants what's best for us anyway, our prayers shift drastically. Because, you know, you might be praying for that promotion at work, and that promotion at work might be your biggest nightmare. And, and God might be saying, that's not what I want for you right now. That's not the, the, the good thing. And so praying and saying, Lord, sounds good. Your will be done. Give me guidance. Give me wisdom. Should I apply for that? Uh, whatever. You know, there's so much there. But the point is, we don't ever have to worry about him drying up uh, his never-ending well of goodness his never-ending well of peace and mercy and grace. It's not if you go to God and say, Lord, would you please uh, work on behalf of my family member who's sick? It's not like he's working on that and then I pray and ask him to work on behalf of a family member that I have that's sick. God goes, whoa, you know, I got a quote, I got a limit here. This is, this is a lot. It's not like, um, I don't know if you ever saw that movie with Jim Carrey where he's God for, I think, a day or something. And he just responds, and he, this is overwhelming. Yes, everything. Everyone wins the lottery, but nobody wins anything. And, you know, all these weird things are happening because he hit a yes for everything. God's not overwhelmed by our, uh, by our request. And he never, it's a never-ending well. It doesn't dry up. You're not going to tap, in, tap into it, and then all of a sudden God goes, you know, 2019, you were in prayer quite a bit. Let's pump the brakes in 2020, all right? <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It says, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine, according to the power that is work within us, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. So, so go to God in prayer. Know that he wants to meet our needs. Know that he's able to meet our needs. And know that he's smarter than us and really knows what we need. So it all works together. So in verse 27, because um, I can't believe I'm running low on time. It says, and he has given him authority to judge because he's the son of man. So here's the verses I talked about just a few minutes ago. Do not be amazed, verse 28, at this. For there's a time coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice. All in their graves are going to hear the very voice. Uh, and come out, those who have done what is good will rise to live. And those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. But myself, I can do nothing. Uh, I, 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 can, I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. So the gospel that Jesus revealed, the gospel that Paul preached, it proclaims grace from start to finish. So then, how are we to explain those verses if it's all about God's grace? How are we to explain those verses that say, um, that suggest you must work to be blessed as thunder rolls in the background? What? That's perfect. I should, man, what a sound effect team I have. Um, it says, Jesus said, those who have done good will rise to live. That's very clear, right? Those who have done good, there's nothing tricky about that sentence. Those who have done good will rise to live. So people can, in their minds, start to get a little worried. So like, Jesus, could you be clear on that? Because like, what percentage do I have to be at? Like, where do I have to land? Because I want to live, and I, I've done some good, 
But there's been moments in my life, like there's moments in everyone's life where there's, it's not a good moment, right? Like, am I good? Am I going to live? What does that mean? So I'm going to bring clarity. I'm not going to stop it right here because this is important. Um, Jesus tells us a, a, a few verses earlier um, what this means. He says, I tell you the truth. This is in verse 24, 524. Whoever hears my word, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has, possesses, it's a done deal, eternal life and will not be condemned. That means you're not going to be raised just for God to judge you. In fact, I don't have time, but Revelations is clear. We should look forward to our judgment because our judgment isn't Let's put up the big screen. Let's watch everyone every moment in Pastor Matt's life. No, it's, it's a judgment of rewards. And so basically it's just all good stuff because he's already removed all of our sins. And so what's left is just the blessings. What's left is just the, the work that we've been a part of, the fruit he has bo uh, born out of our lives. And we get rewarded for that. So we're looking forward to as believers for that moment. But he says this, he says, um, you believe, here's my words, believes him, you have eternal life, will not be condemned, it's crossed over from death to life. So doing good, John 5, 29, what is this doing good? Jesus defines it as simply hearing and believing Jesus. You go, it can't be that easy. It can't be that simple, Pastor Matt. That's what it means. That's the qualification for life. Well, of course it is. If you add anything else to it, it becomes a work-based salvation system. It's simply hearing and believing the gospel. And that is the beauty of what I was able to share during the prayer request time when I met with the lady. It's not confusing. Everlasting life is all about is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. It's nothing more, nothing less. And so you might say, well... There's got to be, I know in Scripture, if I search it, there's got to be some work that God requires from me. You're right. There is. John 6, 29. Go one flip one chapter. John 6, 29. Jesus answered, the work of God is this. So this is pretty clear. What is the work of God that I have to be involved? Jesus said, the work of God is this. To believe in the one he has sent. Hearing and believing. <laughs> you got to believe Jesus is the Messiah. You have to believe that your life is in jeopardy. You are on death row and you need a Savior who will forgive, who will be able to forgive you of your sins by receiving his sacrifice. It's as simple as that. So if you want to impress God, yeah, I want to impress God, Pastor Matt. That'd be pretty cool. I want to impress God. Should I build a bigger boat? The Noah, I impress God? No. You want to impress God? Be impressed with Jesus. You want to do something good in your life? Then marvel at Jesus. Because when you're persuaded that Jesus is who he says he is, and you live from that persuasion, that is the most productive thing you can do with your life. Because it is being attached to the vine that all of this fruit is born. You can do nothing of yourself. Um, and so the seed of God's word is fruit, fruitful. It will grow and it will bear a harvest. But we can hinder the process. Doubt, unbelief, trying to make things happen. That's one of the most destructive things we can do. That's why he says, labor to enter into his rest. I'm absolutely convinced that the most creative and fruitful people in the world have seen Jesus, have been undone by his love, and they're resting in their Father's unconditional approval. If this is you, the promise is that you will shine like the stars. That's what it says in Philippians 2.15. So as we wrap this up, I just want to point this out real quick in case you missed this part. Um, I'm just rephrasing what I kind of already said. Religion says, beware the books that will weigh your works. That's religion. 
But the gospel declares God keeps no record of your wrongs. Mm -hmm. Religion says you better busy up your life with good works. But Jesus says there's only one work that counts, and I already did. Rest in me. And don't be amazed at this. For a time is coming, and all who are in their graves will hear his voice, and they'll come out. Those who have done good to everlasting life. Those who have rejected the Savior to uh, condemnation and judgment. But to do evil, I don't have this slide, but this is a bonus slide. To do evil, what does it mean to do evil? This is another way of saying the same thing I already said. To do evil in the religious sense is to break the rules, right? I didn't follow all the 613 commandments perfectly. But to do evil in the biblical sense is actually to harm yourself by thrusting away the word of God, Acts 13, 46, suppressing the truth, Romans 1, 18, and trampling the Son of God, Underfoot, Hebrews 10, 29. It's all, it's all about rejecting Jesus. So Deuteronomy 30, 19 says, I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life. Everyone gets a choice. Everyone gets a choice. And Jesus wants us to choose life. This isn't rocket science. If you reject life, what's left? God in himself is all-sufficient, has fullness of life, just as Jesus did. And when he gave us his only begotten son, we've been given everything that we need to reign in this life, to have our needs met. And of course, we're going to reign in the life to come, everlasting life. So let's bow our heads and let's thank God for what he has done for us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you for the clarity that you have no needs, which is great because we have a lot. And the fact is that that should be paramount on our minds. Quite often when we pray, we're kind of trying to work it all out ourselves. Like, I got this need and I... I don't know, maybe I should do this, maybe I should do that, maybe maybe I should figure this out some way. How about like slowing down, taking a moment and saying, God, you know better than I do. You know what's on my heart, you know the thing that I'm, I'm struggling with, I don't know what to do. Or give me wisdom, that's what I need here. Or God, provide an answer. Lord, uh, open a door, close another door. You know, whatever it is, Lord, I know that you will meet my needs. You supply um, all these blessings to me that I need in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Lord, I thank you that you gave us Jesus Christ, who the Bible is very clear, lives in us. And he has absolute fullness of life too. So if we just walk according to the Spirit, our needs are taken care of. You see, it's, it's not natural. It doesn't come uh, by anything that we would understand in the physical realm. It's supernatural. It's spiritual. And it's not easy to do because so much is trying to knock us off of walking according to the Spirit. Lord, may we labor to do one thing, and that's to enter into your rest. Understand that you've provided for us everything we need for absolute fullness of life. So by faith, we give you all the praise and all the glory and we know that you've given us what we need for now. And we look forward to the day that we're going to have glorious new bodies as well. So we celebrate that truth and that fact. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. With that being said, let us uh, stand and sing forth the very praises of our Lord and Savior, Jesus.